conversations or is it attached to slot filling? Okay, so that's the fun of natural language processing. So conversational assistants are pretty hot these days. Everybody wants to build one. And you can build one to do a variety of things, like Vijay talk, interactive discovery or search, question answering, fact questioning, who is, you know, who was the first president of United States. Or you can just do small talk, hi, hello, are you a human? You know, I'm feeling bad, stuff like that. And particularly the thing that I'm going to talk about is getting tasks done. Okay, variety of tasks, starting from recharging your phones, ordering your food, ordering mobiles, booking flights. You can, uh, so there are pros and cons of using conversation in getting tasks done. The idea is to minimize the user effort in, in number of clicks that it does and to, to finish these tasks. Okay, so building a, a bot that does tasks for you is a non-trivial job. I hope I'm not echoing too much. Uh, yeah, so there are several layers. Uh, th the, at the top layer is the dialogue where you interact with the user to figure out what he intends to. And there are two parts to it. One is spoken language understanding, which is the user said something, what does it mean? Second, respond to, to that. Once you have figured out a bunch of expected values for the task, you, you create an order, recharge phone, you, you connect to the recharge provider and, and set up an order. When the order is set up, you ask the user to pay for it. And finally, after the user has paid, then there's order processing and delivery. If you have ordered food, the food should be delivered to you, stuff like that. So, the, so AI or natural language processing or dialogue is, is just a small part of setting up a business of, of uh, uh, conversational assistance for getting tasks done. And since we have 15 minutes, I'll just focus on a small part of the dialogue, uh, which is spoken language understanding and a particular way to do spoken language understanding. And I'll show how deep learning gets involved there. Yeah, so doing the dialogue, there are multiple challenges again. Understanding what the user said, what the sentence means is, is the crucial one. The, you, you often users want to small talk a little bit before getting down to thing and that there could be topic changes and users could ask from the from the main topic of the conversation. And there are a bunch of decisions, how much UX you put, how much UI you put, how much chat you put. Uh, it has to be very fine tuned for maximum experience. Okay, so again, I'm going to just focus on spoken language understanding. What does it mean? In general, it's a very complex task. You get, if you get arbitrary sentence, it's a very complex thing. And there's a huge amount of research that does that. For the for chatting or when user types normally short sentences, the task is pretty can can be narrowed down. Okay, so you are basically looking for three things. When you get a sentence, recharge this number for rupees hundred. You get the domain, the the mobile, the intent, which is to recharge, and there are things called slots which you want to fill, which are those expected values. So for doing a recharge, you want the user to at least tell you that the phone number is this, and the amount is this. Okay, this is the main minimal thing required. Another example, show me flights from BLR to Delhi on 4th July. Domain traveler flights, intent search, there could be other intents, book a flight also, and slots. So there are three slots that the user tells you, the location dot from, which is BLR, location dot to, which is Delhi, and date of departure. Note that he hasn't told you how many people are traveling, food preferences, you know, uh, time he wants to fly, stuff like that. So there's a bunch of slots he, that he provided in the first sentence and you have to interact with him to figure out. That's what the conversation is all about. Okay, and we'll be focusing on how to solve this problem using deep learning. Okay, so filling in these slots is, is called the slot filling problem. A very popular, well-researched problem in the, in the speech community. And interestingly, for, for the narrow context that we have of user chats, where there's a limited vocabulary and, and shorter sentence, uh, this this particular problem suffices many cases to understand what the user means. They are more, g in general, the semantic parsing, which is which is pretty complex. This is an instance of it. Okay, so what is slot filling, or how do you formulate it as a as a more mathematical problem? Uh, essentially, it's an instance of sequence labeling. You have the sequence. Yeah, so you have the sequence, and for every item, it's processed left to right. Every item gets a label. O labels are outside, I don't understand. This is the phone number you have extracted. This is irrelevant, irrelevant, 
amount. Again here, PLR, log dot from, Delhi log dot to, depart, depart. So essentially, you get the sentence, you get the sequence, you label it, and you extract the labels and the corresponding values. Okay, and the, so here, they are, they are contiguous labels, so you extract both of them and fill it. So I'm simplifying a lot of stuff here, but just to get the, and people who are familiar with part of speech tagging or named entity recognition are, have, have seen variants of this problem. Okay, a little bit math before you cringe in your seat. Uh, very simple mathematics. There are a bunch of outputs, which are those labels, which the inputs, which are which is the sentence, and you want you can define a probability over output output labels or sequences uh, given a particular x. So probability of y given x that's factorized in a particular. Way. So you predict the probability of every output given the bunch of inputs you have. Okay. And the goal is to maximize the output sequence. So you have a bunch of sequences labeling the same input, and you want to have the one with maximum probability. That's what this is. So yeah, so in this case, uh, this is the x, x, x0, x1, x2, x2, y is y0, y1, OK? So that's, that's simple math involved. I'm going to sell a little bit of math to make you understand a little bit how RNNs, which are the primary tools, uh, work. So traditionally, this problem before deep learning or before deep learning was applied to this problem, conditional random fields were, were the popular choice to do that. They tried to maximize given manual features, so mostly syntactic features, you know, uppercase, lowercase, post tagging, so on. And re recently, I think period of last four or five years, RNNs have taken over, uh, like other fields, RNN perform much better than CRF. Uh, they learn the features automatically and and the idea is to summarize prefixes, prefixes of the sentence using a hidden context. And that keeps track of the context. So I don't know how many of you have seen this. If, if you have you know, studied circuits, the basic, basic feed power nets are like acyclic circuits. They don't have loops. And RNNs have loops. So they're sequential circuits. Okay. So you can unroll this loop, and you get a bunch of these. And the, this, this, if you have read about LSTMs uh, and other variants of RNA, the, you can make this box, each box, very complex. And you can make in order to track the history properly. Uh, so modulo that box, the, the, the arithmetic of RNA is pretty simple. So given the current context HT and the current input XT, it's a linear combination of HT and UT and a function that gives you the next hidden state. So this is essentially a recurrent state computation. You have a hidden state, you get the next input, you update it, you get the new state. And this HT sort of summarizes your previous prefix XTs. That's all that's going on, okay? And these Vs and Us can get arbitrary calculated. They could use uh, XTs and HTs again. All right. So that is the, so yeah. So uh, it's RNNs are the machinery that we are going to use the uh, solve the sequence labeling problem. Yeah, let's. I'm, I'm going to go through a, a, a small number of varieties of RNN and see how how hard it is. Explain how hard the problem is, and and what do you have to add to the basic RNNs to to make solve the problem with greater ac accuracy. Okay, so yeah, so I just showed you this, which which I'm going to use these dependency diagrams. Uh, so X x0 feeds into h0, which generates this output label, OK? So I mean, this could be Delhi, and you want location.2, OK? And as you go to the right, these HTs capture the history of x0s and generate yt. So looking at the whole history, generate these yts, all right? And yt is also a function, uh, if you're familiar with the sigmoid and softmax. So here you apply sigmoid to get the next state. Here you apply softmax to get the output classification vectors and you select one of them. All right, so these are basic elements where Elman RNNs where the de dependencies of yt is on the previous x's and the hts, okay? So you don't look in the future, you don't know what the previous output label was, okay? And that could lead to problems. So the same example that I showed you, this is the kind of problem you can run into. Sentence, Bialu Delhi, log dot from, this is correctly labeled, this is wrong. This should be log dot two, okay? And why this could happen? Because you had a training set where Delhi was in log dot from in some 
particular example. But the RNN failed to understand that once you have seen log dot from, you should have log dot to after that. You can't have log dot from. It didn't learn from the training sample. And we didn't, the re, the, you know, one of the reasons it didn't learn is because we didn't help it learn uh, properly. And essentially, it doesn't understand that the outputs labels are also dependent. There's a dependency among them. Our formulation, mathematical formulation, didn't support it. So now, Jordan arguments. Essentially, we have to fi figure out the dependencies of outputs, okay, among the outputs. And, you know, if you are willing to pour a bit on the math, here, ht plus 1 is dependent on ht and xt, okay, the previous hidden state and the input, current input. Here, it's not dependent on the previous, it's dependent instead on yt. Okay, so, so I'll let you think about it a little bit. What happens if you make it dip the next state dependent on the uh, previous yt? This yt y is in turn dependent on the previous, so you're capturing the summary of previous x's, okay? And on top of that, you're also capturing this w, okay? So if you had only ht here, you wouldn't have captured this weight matrix w, which is generating the output and uh, to, to generate the Okay, so this is a particular way to to capture the input dependency. Uh, sorry, output dependency on them. Okay, uh, the the key idea being again that you are able to also capture the effect of W in the next state. Earlier it wasn't. So now this should help you uh, get the right labeling log dot two because. Okay, so this is one way to to improve the performance of RNN, and in practice it does help you. There's another way, so uh, CRFs, so this is a sort of diagrammatic represent of CRFs. They were XTs again, YTs again, obviously. There's no hidden layer. So hidden layers are were brought about by neural networks and that's, that's the artifact of neural network. So what you used to do, you had features that combine XT and YT, I will call them, and there was a correlation feature between the output labels. So given a particular output YT, what is the probability that the next label will be yt plus 1. That is what this, this, this matrix is capturing. Okay, So this is a different way of capturing the, the output uh, dependencies. Now, can you combine this idea with, with what I just said, Jordan and RNNs? Uh, first of all, it doesn't make sense. So in Jordan and is what you do is that the input, you try to improve uh, the network ability to understand by by adding x's and y and y's the in the inputs the sort of input dependency you can use this idea on the other side the output sides in the loss functions we haven't optimized the loss function yet you could in rns the the loss function was simple you know per label loss you just add them and that's a loss so you generate uh, log dot 2 and instead you expect a log dot from you figure out it's different probability difference, you add all of those different, that's the loss, okay? Uh, you could instead uh, improve the loss function by adding this correlation, adding a new weight matrix, A, which learns correlation between output labels, and have it learn together with, 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 with YTs uh, uh, in, a, in a back propagation style. And, and, and this, this also, this is a different way of capturing uh, the, the output dependency as compared to uh, the adding YTs uh, to the next hidden state. All right. So I don't know how much time I have. Uh, so I, I just wanted to. So CRFs, Elman RNNs, Jordan added it. Jordan, you add those output dependency in hidden state. Elman plus CRF. The variety of combinations that you can build. So note that there's Jordan plus CRF, which has both output de dependencies in YT and the loss function together. And yeah, you could stare at this. And this is already pretty good uh, on on this particular. So th there are differences between you know learning these mo uh, th running RNNs on you know canned data sets like ATIS versus real life, you know, user text. Uh, generally, the vocabulary is fixed here, and uh, yeah, you don't have misspellings and so on. So 
on that set CRFs are, are good, but help. just putting in an RNN instead of manual features using deep features itself helps. If you have output dependence, it helps further. And adding CRS gives you a slight advantage, uh, not much. In practice, if you're getting millions of chats and you want to be closer to, you know, 100%, these, these differences do matter. Okay. And yeah, so that's, that's the sort of sentence. So I basically, so yeah, I basically told you about, tried to introduce the slot filling problem, which is at the core of understanding what user chat mean to the computer and solution using recurrent neural networks, a bunch of architecture, essentially, how do you capture the output dependency? There are various tricks and there are various upcoming papers also which try to capture these, have, have new tricks which capture them. And the, these tricks determine the efficiency a lot in practice. I didn't talk about a number of other architecture which you could, you know, so you could have bi-directional RNNs, this is the diagram here. So in the previous formulation, you could have the HT hidden state is dependent only on the past. It doesn't look at the future. How do you make it dependent on the future? You have another parallel network running from right hand side. And at every point you do a linear combination of them, generate an output, or you can learn the, the weight matrices here. Okay, that, that, that helps you capture both the backward and the forward input dependency. So in practice, there are some cases, but mostly we have observed that forward capturing the past history is sufficient. Okay, that, that, that's one architecture that will help you with few more decimals. And you could also do windows or instead of considering one input at a time, you could consider, you know, triplets of interviews, sort of like n-grams. And you could, at every state, you feed in these triplets, overlapping triplets, overlapping windows of input. That helps you a few more points. Yeah, so, so that, that, that's what I basically wanted to communicate, uh, uh, the, 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 how hard the solving the problem is and are there, I want to leave you with the thought that are there, if you think more about it, are there better architectures that could help you solve this output, capture these output correlations better? Yeah, thank you, that's it. I think we have time for a couple of questions and then Nishant will be available also in the Birds of Feather session soon after.